All right. Well, I got a request for a question that I think is a great question, actually, for anyone to answer in any retail business, obviously, is how do you determine what your profit margins are going to be <clears throat> or should be? And I want to just preface this by saying that I'm not a finance person. Uh, if you've ever worked with me, you know that. But my background and my experience in retail, I would probably weave my way into finance and finance answers in a different way than a person with a good you know, math background would. So I'll talk about it in the street language that I understand it in. And so first, what I think about when I think about how to understand what margins are, we have to back our way into it first and figure out what we're selling and where we're selling it. And we have to figure out what the maximum price point on a retail side that we can offer a product for. You know, if I really think about what Juice Press was um, somewhere around 2015, the company that uh, started in 2010, when Juice was the primary category, in order for that business to have enough cash to be able to expand and be able to afford the corporate and not be reliant on uh, raising money, we really had to be charging $25 for a bottle of juice. And obviously nobody will pay $25 for a bottle of juice. So you have a problem. You have to work your way back and say, okay, well, what will people pay for a bottle of juice in New York City for a great brand that was uh, as popular as it is? And we came to the conclusion through testing that the $12 bottle of juice was a difficult sale and it uh, alienated a lot of shoppers and you have a very limited audience for it. And where do we come up with the $12 juice? Well, it originated with when I started in 2010, most people that were doing bottled juice in retail, they had watered down non-organic cold pressed juice and they were selling it for between eight and $10 for a bottle of 16 ounce juice in a plastic bottle with a basic label on it. And people thought that was expensive. We, we would hear the comments that people would make were similar to the comments that people likely made when Starbucks came into existence, when they would joke that people were spending three or $4 for a cup of coffee. And of course that became fashionable and they really, um, set themselves apart from other coffee people and it became the norm to charge, you know, three to four dollars for a drink. Uh, for some time, they were able to create drinks that they probably charge upward of eight dollars for more. I'm not a coffee guy from Starbucks. I don't know all the drink lines that they have, but we can see in our juice business, there's definitely a limit on what people are going to spend. So let's assume that $10 is a sustainable price for a bottle of juice. What size do you put it in? Is it a 12 ounce size? Is it a 14 ounce size? Is it 16 ounce? Well, it depends on the formula and it also depends on whether or not you're using organic produce. But let's say that in the year 2020, the right size for a bottle of juice is 14 ounces. Are you using chard and dandelion and kale? Are there ingredients in there that are expensive? That's really the big thing that you have to think about when you're creating a formula. And when we are considering what the margins should be, the baseline is to figure out whether or not our customers are going to mostly buy juice from us. Is 60% of our sales going to be from juice? Is it going to be 30% of our sales? If we're doing projections for a business that hasn't opened or a brand new business, we don't necessarily know exactly how to guess what the ratio of sales is going to be divided up. Is it going to be partly food, partly salads? Is it going to be smoothies? All the different categories that you're building in your company are going to determine how important it is that you're hitting top margins on your bottled juice. So the fair rule of thumb as a starting point would be to say that in the food business, it's long been established that if something costs a dollar, you got to sell it for $4. You have to mark it up in that way. That's just for the, the, the purpose of understanding your food costs. It doesn't take into consideration your corporate. It doesn't take into um, 
into consideration what your labor costs are actually going to be. So when you're building out your business model, you obviously have to, if you're actually in business, you know what all your fixed expenses are already. And if you're actually already operating, you can see what your um, labor costs are. And your variable costs that exist are things that are constantly changing. That also has to be on the spreadsheet. So when you build out your business model, what you're basically going to try to do is get to a point where you have a 20% margin before taxes and possibly even before uh, corporate uh, expenses, corporate uh, salaries. That's generally the rule of thumb, but that rule of thumb does not necessarily work in every business. A smaller business working on a 20% margin may struggle to uh, pay its owner. Um, you might actually make it as a business where you're paying your rent, covering your food costs, paying for your labor, you know, making sure the lights stay on, you have enough money to uh, maintain your facility, but at the end of the day, there's not enough money to actually take a paycheck for yourself. So to answer a specific question, when someone says, what's the margin supposed to be? And that's like asking how long a piece of string is. Well, you know, where does it start? Where does it end? The way to look at it for me going forward in the year 2021 is to say that if I'm going to disrupt the industry again, I don't want to be the most expensive guy in juice because I'm going to limit my opportunity to do business. So what I think about juice in 2021 is it's almost a lost leader because you're selling a commodity at this point. At this point, I don't think there's anybody out there that thinks it's extraordinarily difficult to get juice into a bottle. And so you're, it's, it's almost selling the, the, the bulk ingredients, but you're doing one tiny thing to get it into the bottle. And I don't, I'm not sure that the consumer values the effort that you're putting forth. And so this, I guess, changes the question a little bit to what things you can do to be able to ask the highest price and be able to really get the customer to appreciate the value. And so that really ties back into the overall operation and the overall innovation of your setup. So here are some examples of things that I think create better value for the products. One is in your facility, can your guest see all the boxes of produce that you have to bring in, check in, get prepared, and then wash? Well, if you have enough space, I think it's amazing to have an automatic produce washer. I have video of automatic produce washers on this site. They run about $10,000 um, and probably going to cost you another three to $5,000 to install it. Plus you need the space and the peripheral equipment, which is dunnage racks for the boxes, storage, you know, for uh, clean produce. When you, when you, depending on the size of your business, when you're calculating how much space that you need to wash produce, it's really based on your overall volume because you're going to be washing produce for salads and foods and things like that. Uh, if that's part of your business, don't underestimate how much space you need to properly wash produce and keep the operation safe and clean. So it's my opinion that if a customer, if a customer sees wa you washing produce, not only do they get to see the effort and the labor and how much work goes into it, which plants something subconscious in their mind, like, oh my God, I don't want to do that at home. That adds value to what it is that you're actually doing. The other thing that's really important is people have to see how much work it is to actually make cold pressed juice and get it into a bottle. So having a live production area is really important. We know from experience that when juice press took live production out of those stores, even though the expenses went down labor, obviously, and you put it into a central commissary, your sales went through the floor, sometimes as much as 60 to 70 percent reduction in your overall sales in a very short period of time. The magic was gone. And also, I think people just get this impression when they see a static bottle sitting in a refrigerator, they just get the impression that it's too easy and that stuff just sits there a long time and it's not fresh. And so you're devaluing what your retail price can be. So to maximize the retail price, and, and really the threshold limit in this country is $12. If you went to a place like Dubai, where everything is expensive in the first place and people understand that salads are a salad can be $25, then obviously your retail price will be higher, but so will the cost of produce and obviously the cost of labor, potentially your cost of rent. 
each one of these buckets of expenses really has to be calculated and understood what the baseline in your industry is. What we say uh, in the food and beverage industry is that your rent can be a maximum of 10% of your gross sales. So if you have a store that's doing a million dollars in sales, just divide that by 10% to figure out what a reasonable rent is. And then you should have a, did I say that right? Or multiply it by 10%. Yes, I think it's multiply by 10 Well, anyway, on a million dollars in sales, your maximum rent can be 10% of that gross. That's fair. That's at the high threshold. If you found this unbelievable store and you just have to take it because you know it's going to be a dynamite store, can you play? Can you pay 15%? Well, possibly, but you're definitely going to have to get your volume up and you're very, very critically are going to have to have an incredible layout in your store where you are considering every move that the workers make, how much time you need for cleanup, how much time you need for setup, where machines go. You're really going to have to maximize that and not have any waste or inefficiencies because when you took from the column, when you added to the column of rent that extra 5%, it's going to be really hard for you to find that back somewhere else except in reducing your labor costs because your fixed expenses are going to be your fixed expenses. You really can't, you don't necessarily have control over how much money you're spending on utilities and insurance and technology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when we have a 10 or $12 bottle of juice, if, you, if it costs you $2.50 to $3 in produce, what your real job is, is to create an efficient system for manufacturing your product. And then you have to be extraordinarily talented at making sure that you keep your waste extremely, extremely low. And you don't have any way in the food business with the health and natural businesses like Juice to hide your mistakes from the business model. Whereas in a restaurant business, when you serving alcohol and you can have, you know, you can mark up the alcohol, you know, five to 10 times of what it costs you. And there's no waste with alcohol, literally like, you know, what goes bad with a bottle of vodka, nothing. When you have alcohol in your business, the margins on that side can make up for any mistakes that you would make on your food and your preparations and your cost of your, your ingredients. In the juice business, in the smoothie business, there's nowhere to hide because across the board, everything is working on the tightest and the thinnest margins. So this is where you have to be extremely, extremely proficient as an operator to pay attention to the flow of your production and constantly try to find a way to do things with the least amount of labor. That means if you find a worker who is, you know, $5 more an hour than what you would have liked to spend, but that individual person can accomplish something that one and a half people could accomplish, you're actually saving a great deal of money. And that's actually what you have to look for. You have to find those great people. And then besides finding those great people, you have to have amazing training systems. And that is where the structure of your business really makes it or doesn't. How you put together your training programs, how you manage people in the kitchen, how you observe their ability to clean as they go and organize refrigerators and maximize the space and be rotating first in, first out. All those things that have to go into effect require great management. And this is where a lot of operators get lazy because a lot of people go into the food and beverage business because it seems glamorous to them to have their own retail business. The juice business is certainly glamorous because you meet a lot of great people. You get to uh, partake in a lifestyle that uh, we're obsessed with and we love. And so obviously when we have to go into the kitchen and start doing dirty things like figuring out how to get rid of fruit flies and house flies and uh, you know, small cockroaches and the big water bugs and maybe a mouse and sometimes rats, that's where people really start to collapse under the weight of an operation. You have to be prepared for all that. And you have to be able to handle that. The owner has to be able to handle that. You can't delegate some of this stuff because there's no one who's going to do it better than someone who's actually directly connected to the wallet. Now, how do you scale a business like that? If you're such a vital part of the business, if you are the one who's watching after these things, well, it's really difficult. It's not an easy thing to do. And so my experience was 
I did all these things myself, had great people around me, wrote out my systems, stayed on top of them maniacally, and then got to a point where the people and the systems were so good that I actually would get in the way just by showing up. Because if I showed up to a store and I saw dirty beakers in the three compartments saying, I would wash them, which means I prevented that system from working itself out properly. And instead of walking into a restaurant that you own and complaining that things aren't getting done or worse, rolling up your sleeves and having to do all those things yourself, you have to sit down with your management team and go over the lists of things that have to be done in order to protect the margin. So bookending this back to the original conversation about trying to figure out the margins, because I don't think I'm answering this with a direct positive answer like this is the margin. When you figure out your margins, you really have to actually have a grasp of the entire business model. And unfortunately, if you don't have a spreadsheet in front of you of your friend's juice bar down the block or you know, in another town, you're starting from scratch. You have to sit down and figure out all of the things that you're going to spend on on a monthly basis. And you've got to really realize that you as a business owner are, are probably going to end up working five times harder than you would ever ask a regular salaried employee or an hourly employee to have to work in order to get all these things done. This job is a job that requires a person to be tireless. You bring it home with you. You're sitting in front of your laptop while you're watching late night TV. You're finishing up graphic design stuff or things that you're doing for your marketing team, or you're sitting uh, at home you know, in the evening right after dinner and you've got to get back into your Google Drive and write out a playbook on how you're going to execute something and how you're going to make sure that you maximize sales. The one thing I can say that is an effort of every entrepreneur is to continue to find ways to improve your same store sales year over year because your expenses are going up every year and you want to be able to demonstrate growth in your business because the cost of everything is going up. And so when you have a retail price, which is at the absolute highest point, which we know customers are willing to pay and we're alienating customers because our product is way too expensive, we've got a big problem in our business model because it's very difficult to increase same store sales without increasing prices or without finding ways of cutting corners, which cutting corners is different than looking at your expenses and being smarter about every penny. Cutting corners means that you do things that hurt the business model. For example, I know people that to cut costs, they think that adding you know, three or four ounces of water to a juice formula make it more palatable, maybe are reducing a little bit of the cost of food, but it's not really having the dramatic effect that you think it is, especially when you're not doing 10,000 bottles a day of juice. How much money do you think you're actually saving by adding water? Not that much, and you're compromising the integrity of the product. And so that may have a, um, an adverse effect in the end. So I think I'm not 100% sure that I've answered this question successfully. You know, I do think that, you know, the food and beverage business, like any retail business, is a bit of a puzzle uh, that we you know, have to see all the pieces are scrambled on the floor. We start putting it back together. The idea is if you're going into the juice business or you have a juice business, you really can't build that business with the idea that there's a future, a, a bright, shiny future in $12 juices. You know, I think that what the consumer really wants when they come into a juice bar is they want to feel like they're doing something for their health. And this part of their day when they come into the store is them contributing to their health. So maybe it's a good idea to figure out a clever way to set up your selection of juices in different sizes that where instead of a person saying, God, I'm spending $12 on a bottle of juice, maybe they feel more comfortable spending $14 on two smaller juices Yes, they spent more money, but at the same time, they might feel like they're getting more. And the idea is that if a person is buying a juice for a bottle of $10 and your margin is razor thin, when you set up your retail counter, you've got to really think about how you lay it out so that there's almost a 50% chance that they're going to buy another thing that's sitting on the register that has a higher margin, uh, that's not necessarily something that's being sold everywhere else cheaper, 
sort of something that you're making yourself. Maybe it's raw chocolate or some type of confection or a supplement pack of some type, like a day pack that has three great supplements in it. You're charging four bucks for it. And you don't have to explain anything. Something like vitamin C, a probiotic, maybe B12, maybe T3. Maybe it's four supplements and you're charging five bucks. And you're looking at the cost of that. And maybe the cost of that is $1.60. There's a better margin at five bucks. And I think that those type of things are the things that rescue a razor thin margin. You've got to go into pharmacies like Duane Reed or CVS or whatever the big, big pharmacy brands are in your town. And you have to look at the ones that are chained and well put together. Their, their shelves are stocked to the brim, stores well lit, well staffed, speed of service is, is, is present. When you look at that, you can say, okay, this looks like a healthy business. What is their core product? What is their version of our juice? Where we know that people see it as a premium. We know that people come to look at it and gawk at it. How does that pharmacy get people to spend money on things that have a blinder uh, value to them while they're selling toilet paper for 20 cents profit? How do they keep the lights on? And that's, uh, that's how you have to study retail. You've got to look at other businesses that are razor thin margins that have tremendous operating expenses between corporate and all the things that they have to do to get a product on the shelf. Um, and you have to try to figure out what they're doing, break their business apart, take pictures, you know, write in a retail journal about what you think. I actually keep an Instagram page literally just for myself. I think there's a hundred random people that follow me. It's called retail philosopher where I just take pictures of everything in retail that I find interesting. And I go back to it constantly just to try to, refresh my memory and think about what's great in retail. And so um, this is, there's no real quick answer to any of these things. You know, my partner is a genius in math, great, great uh, retailer, very, very uh, organized human being with put a lot of structure into juice press. And he struggles with the same problems that you do, which is trying to figure out how to increase same store sales. That's a battle that every retail business should engage in and, I, I would venture a guess that most single store units, they never even use the term SSS, same store sales, SSSG, same store sales growth, SSSG, Y, O, Y, same store sales growth year over year. The first time I heard that was in a boardroom with my partners, uh, the co-founder of Home Depot. Ken Langone was on the board of directors of Juice Press, and he looked at me and said, how's your same store sales? And man, did I just stare back at him with a glossy look over my face. I had no idea how to answer him. But the answer at that period of time was same store sales growth were flat. And that's very normal when you look at how product launches generally work. When you launch a product successfully, you're gonna have a launch to a peak point where you're at maximum, maximum, unbelievable turnover in sales. Then there's a plateau and then there's a taping off of the sales. And then what you're trying to do is hope that you can make the tape off of the sales and the slight drop not be a plummet. And what I've seen, there are certain categories that just plummeted because they were definitely trends and their time has come and passed and they're still going to be in existence. There are still going to be juice bars and people are still going to put juice in a bottle. The question is, is what format are they going to use and what new methods are they going to use to entertain their guests and make people say, this is the place I have to go to get my juice and make people say, look, I'm spending, you know, 20, 30 bucks a day here. Some people spend more, some people spend less. But this is a major part of my daily habits. I've got to go to this place. I've got to get my smoothie. I've got to say hi to that friendly cashier or that wonderful smoothie uh, um, smoothie barista, what do we call them? A smoothie barista, a smoothie maker. I don't know, smoothie chef. Call it whatever you want. But the entire experience is critically important. And one could say there is no replacement from the day that you open having the most of your plan actually able to be executed and have it in effect. From day one, you should have the best POS system. You should have a loyalty program. 
uh, put into place that's very well thought out where you really get an understanding of what you're giving away. The tendency of most people in loyalty programs is to give away too much, you know, without understanding what the implication is. And certainly when you have a chain and you're dealing with much larger volumes, like 60, $70 million in sales, if you're giving away uh, 10% to $30 million of it, just do the math. That, that 10% may be too much. So in a smaller business, the loyalty discounts really don't have to be all that much. You know for a fact that when you go into Whole Foods and they say, do you have an Amazon uh, card or you go into your favorite uh, grocery store, um, a chain, obviously, usually, they're always trying to get you to um, give them their phone number so that they can plug that in. And so at some point, you're going to get some kind of rebate or some kind of discount. And if you look closely at those things, you don't really save all that much, but it's the idea that you're saving something and that keeps us from becoming anxious when we're spending. I'm getting a little bit of a discount. Also, when a person has loyalty to your company, they tend to walk a little further to get to your store. So there's so many different subjects within this to unpack. I think what this subject gave me uh, time to think about was I should probably do the next video on same store sales growth and stuff that I wrote about that. that I think that are levers that um, people pull to actually increase their store sales. And uh, I think that could be very helpful. So thanks a lot.